Lord, whoever has faith in me shall have life even though he die. And everyone who has life has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awakening, he will raise me up. And in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. I'd like to make it welcome everyone here to St. Catharines. Everyone is welcome uh, at St. Catharines no matter where you are in your faith journey. And uh, in case you didn't get the sign-in on your way in, uh, please uh, take a moment on your way out. It is in the narthex right by the door. And just a, a little bit about the service this morning. Florence Nightingale was an English scholar, social reformer who was considered the founder of modern nursing. She served as a manager and trainer of nurses during the Crimean War. She was a statistician, a teacher, and is remembered for showing great mercy. We are transferring her feast day of August 12th each year to today in order to have a double celebration of sorts. We will be celebrating Louise's life and at the same time celebrating the contributions to our society made by Florence Nightingale. I will say it is rather unusual to transfer a feast day. Uh, her day is August 12th, uh, so many months away, but I did get special permission from Bishop Perry because of the work uh, and Louise's contribution in raising up Florence as a saint uh, in this church. So I ask uh, that as we uh, celebrate the life of Louise today, that you be prepared to hear Florence's name come up in our liturgy as we celebrate. And please join me in our opening hymn. <laughs>
us pray. O oh God, who gave grace to your servant Florence Nightingale to bear your healing love into the shadow of death, grant to all who heal the same virtues of patience, mercy, and steadfast love that your saving health may be revealed to all. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, by who the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servant Louise, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable, your wound is grievous. There is no one to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you, they care nothing for you. For I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe, because your guilt is great, because your sins are so numerous. Why do you cry out over your land? Your pain is incurable because your guilt is great, because your sins are so numerous. I have done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured, and all your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall be plundered, and all who prey on you, I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal. Says the Lord, because they have called upon, called you an outcast, it is Zion, no one cares for her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in praying Psalm 73, found on page 7 of your worship bulletin. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me by your counsel, and afterwards receive me with glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And having you, I discern nothing upon earth. Though my flesh and my heart would race away, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Truly those who forsake you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful. It is good for me to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. I will speak of all your words in the gates of the city of Zion.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him in his own, on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank you all for coming today. On behalf of my dad, my sister Amy, and our family, we appreciate all the kind words, memories, and prayers that have been shared with us over the past few weeks. Anyone who knew my mom knows that to fully tell the story of her life would require more time than the Episcopal Church will allow me. So I've distilled it to a few highlights, memories, and stories of a woman who lived a full and accomplished life. So to eulogize my mom, I think it's best if I begin at the end. My mom was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in June of 2019, though it was obvious to those close to her well before that. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease that robs people of their ability to function in society and life, and it does the same to their caretakers. My mom spent the last three years of her life in a state of perpetual confusion as her sense of self zoomed through place and time. She was a master at using context clues in order to participate in conversations and appear somewhat normal. But behind the scenes, it was a rough road, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. I would be remiss if I did not advise all of you to take care of your brains by eating a good diet, exercise, try things that challenge you mentally, and brush and floss your teeth. One of the effects of Alzheimer's was that my mom would often tell me stories about encounters she recently had with random strangers. A man walking down the street with wounds that she had to bandage. A kid out looking for a lost dog. A woman crying on a park bench. These encounters were all false, of course. Maybe vague memories sparked by a TV show she'd watched recently, a story someone had told her, or perhaps entirely created in her own unregulated mind. But nevertheless, she believed them to be true and often felt compelled to share them. One day about 18 months ago, she was having a rough time at home and called and asked me to come pick her up. And as usual, I obliged, though I had a long to-do list at home to prepare everything to have family over for dinner that night. I set her to task, slicing and arranging boiled eggs while I checked off other items on my list. Mom was unusually chatty as she worked and she told me a story of how she came across a woman sitting on a park bench sobbing. Mom sat down to her to see if she could offer any help, and the woman told her that she and her husband were in the process of divorcing and she was upset that she didn't have anyone else to turn to. After talking for a few minutes, Mom lent the woman her phone so she could call her sister to come pick her up. This story is not much different than the dozen other versions she often told to fill the silence, but what stuck with me this time was how she ended it. At the end of the story, she said how she felt sorry for the woman because she didn't have anyone to call when she needed help. 
And she finished by saying how grateful she was to have family she can call whenever she needs a ride or a break. And although that doesn't seem like much, that small moment of genuine gratitude gave me a brief connection to the person that had been lost to us for a while. But my mother's life story is much more than the last three years. It's how she spent the other 72 years that brought us all here today. My mom was supposed to have been born on Thanksgiving, but she arrived a month early on Halloween. She was the first child of Mary and Rail Conyers. Two other siblings followed, but both died in infancy. She grew up in the city of Marion, Ohio, and her dad owned a dairy supply business, and in recent years she told us many stories about driving all over central Ohio on sales trips to farms and businesses. She had a special relationship with her dad, and he often took her to Ohio State University football games, igniting a passion for football and college sports that lasted a lifetime. Although her loyalty shifted from Ohio State to MSU, she would never miss a chance to watch Script Ohio and still enjoyed making and eating Buckeyes every year at Christmas. In the late 90s, she served on the Athletic Council at MSU. She knew all the inside gossip, and there were free tickets to just about everything. This overlapped with my undergraduate years at MSU, so needless to say, it was an amazing time for me. Although she grew up as an only child, she had a very close relationship with all of her Gracely cousins. They spent summers together in Ohio and Florida, and as the oldest, my mom was looked up to by all of them. To this day, they still call her cuz. I remember once when I was little and answered a phone call at home, the person on the other end asked to speak to cuz, and I hung up thinking it was a wrong number. <laughs> it turns out it was my mom's cousin Susie, and I just wasn't quite up to speed on the nickname situation. In 2015, my mom took the initiative to organize a reunion of all her cousins and their families and inviting them here to Michigan. Many of them came and we all had a wonderful time sharing laughter and memories. She enjoyed showing them her home and the university where she had spent most of her life. My grandmother was a ninth grade English teacher at Harding High School where my parents attended. Anyone who ever met Mary Conyers knows she was a tough, independent woman who set high standards, not only in writing and grammar, but for life in general. Lessons my mom took to heart. Even recently, as mom lay in her hospital bed, just hours out of surgery from her broken hip, she still made time to correct the grammar of the sportscaster while we watched a basketball game in her room. <laughs> when I was young, my mom had a conversation with me about how I came from a long line of independent women who didn't let the typical gender roles of their eras define them. And I should appreciate that and strive to do the same. At this point in the conversation, I remember questioning her logic that a teacher and a nurse were groundbreaking career choices for women. <laughs> I probably said something snarky like, don't give yourself too much credit, you're not exactly rocket scientists or the president. I'm sure she didn't appreciate this. But she explained to me that being a teacher and a nurse were really just a foot in the door. It's what they did within those roles that mattered. Becoming a leader, empowering others, especially other women, to seek their own independence and shape their own lives and careers, that was really the point. It wasn't the career that you chose, but what you did with it that mattered. A friend of mine recently shared with me that my mom was the first college-educated career woman she knew in her life. I believe the phrase, boss-ass bitch, was used. Sorry. <laughs> I may not have really appreciated the lesson mom shared with me at that time, but I certainly do now, as do likely thousands of others who she made an impression on and guided them as they made their way in the world. In high school, my mom was the editor of the Harding Quiver yearbook and played flute, piccolo, and oboe in multiple bands. Really the only high school memories she ever shared with us were of her time in marching band. She actually went early to school and stayed after late to take all the band classes. As a parent and grandparent, she loved watching her kids and grandkids in the band and never missed a concert. By my calculation, she probably saw the Crusaders performed at a Bath Band concert about 17 times. Sadly, her passion for marching band could not continue in college, 
as women were not allowed in the Spartan marching band in 1965. Let that sink in for a minute. She still participated in concert and symphony bands and eventually made it out onto the field at Spartan Stadium in the 80s and 90s as part of the MSU alumni marching band. I am quite sure she was thoroughly disappointed that neither Amy nor I elected to even try out for the Spartan marching band, though I am thankful for Title IX and the fact that the opportunity was available to us if we wanted it. As a kid, my mom read a biography of Florence Nightingale and a seed was planted. She knew early on she was going to be a nurse. Michigan State University offered her the opportunity not only to study nursing, but also to get the heck out of Ohio, and she never looked back. After earning her RN degree at MSU, she worked in New Orleans while my dad went to graduate school at Tulane, and then they headed to Long Island so that she could get her master's degree. She started looking for a job as a nursing instructor and applied at a Big Ten school about 45 miles southeast of here. <laughs> On her way to that interview, she stopped in at the MSU College of Nursing for a quick reunion visit with some of her professors, and the dean offered her a job on the spot. Needless to say, she never made it to Ann Arbor. Being the child of a nurse generates some interesting stories. When we were kids, no injury was ever that bad because she'd always seen worse and was willing to share the gory details. When I was nine, I fell and broke my wrist at a sleepover. I returned the next morning and showed her my swollen wrist and, and demonstrated that I couldn't move one of my fingers. She decided to just put an ace bandage on it and told me it would have to wait and then deal with it when they got back from the MSU football game. <laughs> I eventually saw a doctor and I have full use of my left hand. <laughs> Another time in high school, my piano teacher asked me to wait in the car because she needed to talk with my mother. I sat out there convinced that either I had done or said something to get me in serious trouble or that the piano teacher was telling my mom I was some savant piano prodigy. Clearly my broken wrist had not affected the piano career. It turned out that their 30-minute conversation was not about me at all. My piano teacher just needed free medical advice. <laughs> this is a very common occurrence in my childhood, as I'm sure most of you can appreciate, since about 90% of you are nurses or nurse-adjacent here. <laughs> but silly stories aside, my mom's career as a nursing educator was the foundation of her life. She worked at the College of Nursing for over 40 years, and her dedication to nursing theory and Florence Nightingale especially are probably unrivaled. When I googled her name last week, the second suggestion that popped up was Louise Sealander's Florence Nightingale. She would be so proud. From a kid's perspective, I basically knew what she did, but I undoubtedly knew that her work was her passion. At a young age, I probably knew more about the Crimean War, the London sanitation system, and Sigma Theta Tau than the average 10-year-old. Most days she was gone for clinicals before we left for school in the morning and arrived home just in time for dinner where she would share the drama from the most recent faculty meeting that probably went on for way too long. <laughs> Some of mom's best friendships were made at the College of Nursing. As a kid, I remember game nights with Debbie, the other Louise, Millie, and Isabel and their families. My parents hosted barbecues for the college and attended countless weddings of former students. We got ice cream pies at Christmas from Carol, ran into Carrie and Emily at every basketball game, and of course we got our brother from another mother, Patrick. But from a kid's perspective, it seemed like the best part of being a nursing instructor was going to the conferences. Some of those nursing conferences seemed like a wild time. There are pictures that back that up. As interesting as a talk on Nightingale in theory and practice may seem, the real fun was the after parties. And after a while of having such great time in conferences and tours, mom decided to host her own, and Education UK International was born. Mom and her British counterpart and friend, Charles Turner, hosted tours to bring British nurses to the US and take American nurses to the UK. Some of you may still have the denim tote bags. At the time, Amy and I were pretty lucky to be of an age where it was easier to take us along than leave us at home. So we got to go to England multiple times, as well as a half dozen other countries around Europe. 
While mom and Debbie were at their conferences, dad took us to art galleries and museums all over. Her international travel provided an education for us that we never could have gotten at home. I fell in love with Tudor history, Amy's fascination with the hotel industry was ignited, and dad's teapot collection increased significantly. <laughs> Shortly after moving back to East Lansing in the mid-70s, my mom found this church. She attended services most every Sunday and weathered the tenure of at least seven different ministers. She sang in the choir, served in a variety of leadership roles, and started Blood Pressure Sundays, which Amy and I personally disliked because we would have to come extra early and stay extra late while she checked the parishioners' blood pressures and dispensed more medical advice to anybody who wanted it. There was often a long line. As soon as I was old enough to graduate from Sunday school, mom signed me up to be an acolyte. I spent so many Sundays sitting on that bench assisting with the services and attempting to light the candles, which there used to be many more of, without burning this place down. Now surprisingly, church services weren't always that engaging for a 12-year-old, and sometimes I would wiggle, or heaven forbid, slouch in my seat. Luckily, mom being up in the choir loft could signal me to sit down and pay attention without everyone else in the church seeing. After a while, I just didn't look up there anymore. <laughs> when mom wasn't working or going to church, she did make some time for fun in her life as well. My parents went to the Bahamas with their good friends Don and Louise every summer for about 20 years. The pictures on the photo boards confirmed that a good time was had by all. After her retirement, they made a couple cross-country road trips and stopped to visit many family and friends along the way. Over the years, they traveled across Europe, Australia, Hawaii, Vancouver, and took a cruise on the QE2. She advised me to always keep my passport up to date, and a full passport is evidence of a life full of adventure. Before I finish, I would like to offer a few bits of life advice from Louise. Number one, have a dog. <laughs> you may not think you are a dog person, but you are wrong. When you get a dog, spoil it rotten and then get another. My brother-in-law Ben says if he could come back in another life, it would be as one of Louise's dogs. Soji, Pittsburgh, Higgins, Boomer, Thornton, Wyatt, and Rudy will all confirm this. Number two, if you have somewhere to be, be sure to arrive early, especially the airport. Leave for the airport extra early. Once we got to the Delta counter so early, they laughed at us. Then, then we spent the next six hours at the Detroit airport before our flight left on time. <laughs> Number three, plan that family get together. Keep in touch, whether by using social media, making a phone call, or sending a card or an email. Don't let state lines or time zones stop you from reaching out. Get to know somebody by inviting them over for dinner. I suspect that virtually everyone here today has eaten a meal at my parents' house or been invited to do so. Many colleagues, everyone from church, neighbors, my piano teachers, my actual teachers, her hairdresser. I think Patrick actually lived at their kitchen table for six months while finishing his PhD. Mom made it a point to get to know people by inviting them over, and thankfully Dad did all the cooking. And lastly, be like Florence. You may know that Florence and I share the same birthday on May 12th. My parents say that's a coincidence, but being that mom was a nurse, she probably knew how to make that happen. <laughs> However, this often meant that for many years, mom was gone for a lot of May. She led alumni nursing tours that hit all the important Nightingale sites. And of course, the best time to do that was during nursing week in May meaning she was often gone for my birthday and Mother's Day. Sometimes my relationship with Nightingale wasn't always one of appreciation, but as an adult, the lessons of her life aren't lost on me. Some say that if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life, and both my mother and Florence exemplified this sentiment. Be an advocate for your profession by sharing with others, and create a place where all are welcome and can work as equals. If you see something that could be changed for the better, step up and find a way to make it happen. This applies not just to nursing, but to life in general. To finish with a quote from Florence, 
When I am no longer even a memory, just a name, I hope my voice may perpetuate the great work of my life. Thank you. Good morning, friends. I am the other brother that was never asked for. Um, and in the spirit of sibling rivalry, now I have to follow my other sister. The fact that so many of you have traveled, uh, for some of you, great distances to be here today, I think speaks testament to the legacy, the life, the impact of Louise Seelanders. Excuse me. I can't help but to think that there's hundreds if not thousands more who she's impacted who aren't here today, but is continuing on her legacy throughout the United States, Europe, Mexico, who knows, that passport was full, I guarantee you that. How do you talk about a woman in five or so minutes that is deserving of a Ken Burns documentary? replete with the close-up zooms on the photos, which many of us had a chance to look at today. So I'll do my best. We may have some pauses along the way, so bear with me. But first, let me tell you about my teacher, Dr. Louise Seelanders. <clears throat> Mentorship is the greatest teacher. And mentors help you to achieve things you did not think are possible. And that is what Louise was to so many students. I met Louise on my very first day of nursing school. And those of you who know me are probably not surprised to hear that I was a few minutes late. <laughs> I got lost in the dreaded clinical center auditorium my college roommate, Ben, who's here, was there with me. We did not know each other yet. And our very first lecture in Dr. Struble's course was a lecture from Dr. C. Landers, who is going to teach us about nursing history. Now, those of you who are nurses are um, probably like many of my students and uh, don't realize that your first day of nursing school isn't going to be about doing CPR or intubating people or giving medications at a frantic rate. It is about, apparently, nursing history. <laughs> Louise and I's friend, Carol Vermeesh, is here and she asks me now to deliver a lecture on nursing history the first day of class. Also little did I know that that very first lecture would quite literally change my life in ways I never thought possible. From moment one, talks of Florence Nightingale, of the evolution of modern history, of nursing's role in the developing world, impacted me in such a way I was inspired from day one. I remember being absolutely captivated about the potential of nursing. And I was not alone in that class, or in future classes, or in past classes. Later that year, like most undergraduate students, I was frantically searching for another course to take to get elective credits to get financial aid. And uh, I learned that Dr. C. Landers from the infamous first day of class was offering a nursing history course. Uh, this was also my very first online course, or hybrid. And if uh, any of you remember the technology that existed then, uh, it's far from perfect today. It was very far from perfect then. And Louise was running the ship, so one thing she didn't teach me is technology. <laughs> I enrolled in that course, and again, I learned so much more about nurses that had never, ever been mentioned through any medium that I was familiar with. I was so motivated by this course that I would actually, believe it or not, voluntarily go to my professor's office after class, which she probably dreaded initially, but I would sit down on the infamous orange chair that adorned that office for, I think, generations. Um, that later adorned my very own office as a commemorative gift. 
Dr. Sealanders must have seen something in my interest because eventually we were becoming weekly visits. We would talk about nursing, we would talk about life, and she subtly delivered a pitch about going to London for the summer. I knew I couldn't go, and Louise knew that I had to go. I also learned that Louise was very good at conspiring. <laughs> um, it turns out another, another guest here today, uh, Emily Wilson and Louise, were, were a very good team. I was soon hauled out of Louise's class and sat in, again, the orange chair. I was told that I was going to London because I had to go to London. I came up with every excuse that I could think of uh, not to go there, and she countered with the precision of a hostage negotiator. <laughs> Eventually, we left for London. I scrapped together every dime I had, every piece of financial aid, which again, she made me apply for, so thank you to the McCartneys. And when I was there, I learned so much more than I thought I would ever learn about being a nurse. It was those things that Kate mentioned earlier about nursing's responsibility to be leaders, to change the world, to be the shoulder that everyone can lean on, to move healthcare forward, to be compassionate, to be empathetic, those were Louise's most important lessons. Also in London, she taught me the importance of red Leicester cheese, um, how to pair that with hard cider, and how to make that a meal. <laughs> During that trip, I, with a few other classmates, met up with Louise at the Florence Nightingale Pub. It was there I first met Bill, and uh, if there's any administrators out there, earmuffs, we had a pint, maybe two. We learned that we got along well, that we had a lot in common. And when it was time to graduate, Louise gave me a big hug as I crossed the stage. I was wearing a London flag on my gown to commemorate the trip, as were my roommates. And I left to go take on my first job and she reassured me, you'll be fine. We stayed in touch, even though I lived an hour away, and she one night called me and said, you are going to enroll in a master's program. Again, I did not know this at the time. I thought it would happen. <laughs> but she told me, as she did with most things, you are ready and you will be fine. <laughs> Uh, and that's when I told her I wanted to be a nurse practitioner, and she said, you're a nursing educator. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you're a nursing educator. Um, I had played around with the idea of teaching. I, I volunteered in the sim lab at the college, and so I enrolled in our um, nursing education program. I was admitted through many breakdowns. She said, you'll be fine. Don't worry. Later on, it was time to graduate with a doctorate. I was not ready. Guess what Louise told me? You're ready, and you'll be fine. This time she let me become a nurse practitioner, though. There were again many phone calls. There were panicked nights. There was probably more tears than were deserved. And there was the kitchen table where I uh, completed my not-so-labor of love, completing my TNP uh, project. That kitchen table now has a commemorative plaque marking the occasion. I hope it'll soon be on the National Register of Historic Places. <laughs> the other thing that Louise was famous for was editorial comment. Every missing comma was caught. Every extra comma was caught. My dissertation is probably the most comma-perfect document ever generated. And she did it with famous green pen and that green pen was a sign that it had been read and that you better note every single comment. <laughs> Louise was a teacher. Louise, it turns out, taught me the power of teaching, the impact teaching has. She had unwavering support, encouragement, and enthusiasm for what I was doing no matter how stupidly I did it. <laughs> Louise, it turns out, 
taught me what it was to be a nurse. Dr. C. Landers was always a teacher. Next, let me tell you about Louise, my friend. I could never have known the gift of friendship that I've been given throughout the past 23 years. Louise was the best kind of friend. The kind of friend that was always there. And I mean always there. Maybe I was always there. <laughs> it started with lunch, and then there was conversations, and it soon followed to dinners. We had to explore every restaurant in the Greater Lansing area and then move gradually outward, then to London. <laughs> Turns out food was something that could always get Louise's attention. If you needed something done, take her to lunch. If you need something done, go to dinner. Like so many of you, we were lucky to have the opportunity to laugh, cry, commiserate, commiserate again, see MSU win, see MSU lose sometimes much more often than winning, but we could all revel in a U of M loss. The only thing we disagreed on was Ohio State. <laughs> Louise was empathetic, generous. She was a phenomenal listener. She was genuine, she was brilliant, she was wise. And she was a mentor in the truest sense of the word. But the best word I think I can come up with her is fierce. She was fierce in everything she did. She was unwavering, much to all of our detriment at times. <laughs> Louise was not just a friend, she was a best friend. And I know she was a best friend to many of you also. Finally, let me tell you about Louise, my family member. I could also not have known the family that would adopt me. Poor Amy and Kate never asked for a brother. They didn't want a brother. They got one. <laughs> And it's all because of Louise. This family has changed my life in so many ways. I'm lucky to have them all in my life. Um, and it's all because of the woman we're here to celebrate today. I also want to thank Ben, Chris, Davey, Piper, Colin, Evan, Weird Patrick coming over to all your family events. I love you guys all so much. Thank you for letting me into your family. Unfortunately, because of Louise's family member status, she's had to sit through three graduation ceremonies of mine, plus her own kids. That's torture, and I apologize. <laughs> we celebrated birthdays, weddings, promotions, Christmas, Super Bowls. Louise was always one of the top tier phone calls. After I called my mom and my wife, she'd be the third call. It was always to notify of some personal news, tragedy, or of course, current events with the royal family. <laughs> And her family became my own. She lives on in the immense love that I have for all of the family here. So we're here because I'm not the only person with these stories. We have all been the benefactor of Louise's generosity. Our lives have all been enriched because of the time we've had with her. So today we celebrate those moments that we had and that we were fortunate enough to share our teacher, friend, and our family member, Louise. I will close with a quote from, of course, Florence Nightingale. Because Louise is always a teacher, you will learn a little something about Nightingale today. Live life when you have it. Life is a splendid gift. There is nothing small about it. Louise was a gift, and I will miss her immensely. In the name of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
nurse, teacher, healer, faithful, groundbreaker, world changer. I'm talking about Florence Nightingale and I'm talking about Louise Sealanders. It's my hope and prayer the gravity of this comparison will not be lost. As I mentioned, Florence is commemorated as a saint in the Episcopal tradition. To be talking about Louise in the same sentences as Florence is extraordinary and make no mistake, appropriate. Many here may know that Louise wrote three of the five documents to get Florence Nightingale commemorated as a saint. This was after the proposal to lift her was initially turned down. Florence is now on the Episcopal calendar of saints and without Louise, this likely would not have happened. And that is something that the, not only the Episcopal Church, but our greater society will carry with us forever. This contribution of Louise's strikes me as a continuation of Florence's work. Florence was renowned as a groundbreaking teacher to nurses, especially during the Crimean War. She brought the use of statistics into nursing and in large part made nursing the profession it is today. In that same light, Louise was a teacher to many of our local nurses and beyond, and many of them would later serve as medical first responders to the vastly unforeseen COVID-19 pandemic. These two impactful women were ahead of their time. They broke ground, they persevered, they acted and reacted and did not stand idle. As you heard, Louise taught abroad. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Susan Carter, uh, who also taught abroad, sometimes at the same time, uh, they overlapped, uh, said they were as raucous as middle-aged tenured women professors could be, <laughs> and noted they did spend some time in the pub. What's interesting is that Louise notes in the book she co-authored about Florence Nightingale that she talks about the, the profession of nursing as a calling. And she said, she wrote that Florence said, a calling is to do what is right and best. And that the calling of nursing is so important, it should be thought of as a religious vow. And truly, a calling is for all of us in whatever it is we do. Louise recognized this and carried her faithful Christianity with her everywhere. She was a cradle Episcopalian and didn't waver throughout her lifetime. And she served in her vocation as if it were a religious vow. This was her essence, a Christian teacher, a nurse, and no matter if she was working as a nurse or teaching or spending time with family, while on study abroad, she frequented St. Bartholomew's, a church off the beaten path that shared her love for frankincense, part of our tradition. Florence Nightingale is first and foremost remembered by our faith, faith tradition for being merciful, for showing passion and forgiveness, especially with regard to those she had an advantage over. And nurses almost always have the upper hand on those they minister to. This merciful persona was a part of Louise throughout her life. She was one of those people, as you have heard, that had family who were not related by blood, yet family just the same. She showed them loving kindness in only a way that someone answering a call to ministry can. Louise was a vessel of God's mercy. I'm guessing that while Louise learned more and more about Florence, she thought of her as a mentor as she went through her own life. And to make an even greater impact, Louise took this learning in mentorship and mentored many other protégés along the way. Many are here. 
All the readings today are taken from the readings for the feast day of Florence Nightingale. The gospel talks of the familiar parable of the Good Samaritan. It's probably the most well-known parable in the Bible. And even those of us who aren't Episcopalian or Christian have likely heard it. This, this passage was selected for today is not because of those who kept walking and didn't help the stranger. It's because of those, the person who stopped to help the man in distress, the person who did act and didn't stand idle, the person who acted with mercy. And Louise was such a gifted person, a loving mother and wife, a dedicated Christian, an accomplished teacher, a beloved dog mom. And when she needed mercy shown to her, she was blessed with the wisdom to accept this care of those who showed her mercy at Forster Woods Adult Day Center when she was overcome with dementia. Now it is our turn to pass on what we've learned from the life Louise lived, to show mercy, to go and do likewise, to be a vessel of God's mercy at every opportunity, no matter our profession or calling. And perhaps, and this is Louise's teaching in her later years, perhaps even more difficult to accept mercy when we need it. Louise wouldn't have it any other way. Because friends, death does not get the last word. God has mercifully granted us life after death, and Louise has quite appropriately joined Florence and all those who have gone before her as part of the communion of saints. And for this, even at the grave, we raise our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Please stand. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For our sister Louise, For our sister Louise, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Louise and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. 
You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raised the dead to life. Give to our sister Louise eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our sister Louise to the joys of heaven. Our sister Louise was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give Louise fellowship with all your saints. Louise was nourished with your body and blood. Grant her a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister Louise. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our sister Louise, who was reborn by the water in the spirit of holy baptism. Grant that her death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Give me the rest of Christ to your servant and your saints, for the sorrow and pain are no more. Now you are signing the light of blessing. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Louise. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive Louise into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain 